So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me um, to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're in our series from the book of 2 Corinthians entitled The Pain and the Glory of Christian Living, Amen. The pain and the glory of Christian living. And so we're going through the book of 2 Corinthians. I've said that, that we hear a lot of preaching about 1 Corinthians, not that much about 2 Corinthians. And so we're diving in and we're taking it piece by piece, the, the best that, that we can. And so this morning, our message is entitled, The Spirit and the Glory. The Spirit and the Glory, or I've subtitled it, A Letter from Christ. A Letter from Christ. And I trust that God's going to help us this morning, help me to bring his word to us in a way that will, um, will challenge us, encourage us, that will communicate God's heart for us today, and that God will give each of us ears to hear what he wants to say to us this morning. Amen? Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles with you, um, We have the scriptures on the screen as well, but bring your Bible, follow in your Bible, and um, it helps you to learn God's word a little bit better. So we're going to read through the whole chapter. It's not that long. The Apostle Paul writes, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? For you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. For he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Let me just pause and say, the Apostle Paul is not comparing something of little glory to that with a lot of glory. He's comparing something with, that had a lot of glory with something that has even so much more glory I can't even reach any higher. Hey, Pastor Geek, can you get me a ladder here so I can get up? Right? It's not a little glory versus a lot of glory. It's a lot of glory versus a lot, lot, lot of glory. Okay, we'll go on. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have a hope, we are very bold. For we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds... Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory or from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. And so, Father, we do ask you to help us as we dive into your word this morning. Again, give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us today through it. And in Jesus name, we pray. Amen. So there's a lot to unpack here and we're not going to be able to touch everything, but we'll do our best today. But I wonder, first of all, how many of us have ever needed a letter of recommendation? Any of us here? I know I have, right? Maybe to get a job, sometimes to rent an apartment, to get some sort of credentials for a court case, for a visa, whatever it is. As a pastor, I've had to write lots of letters of recommendation for people for all kinds of situations. 
And what does that letter do for us? Well, it attests to who we are, what we've done, our character or our ability. And the more credible the person writing the letter is, the more value is placed on what that person has written. And so a lot of times people come to me, Pastor, would you write me a letter of recommendation? Why? Because Tim Harris is so well known or because, you know, Tim Harris is such a great person? No, because Tim Harris has a particular position. He's a reverend. He's a pastor of a church. And so with that is supposed to at least come, right, some sort of credibility with what I write. Sometimes people ask me to write letters of recommendation for certain things. And I'm like, I can't do that because I can't lie. You know, we don't want to do that, right? So, but, but, but there are times when we need a, a letter of recommendation and, and, and the value is placed on that letter often based on who has written that letter. Well, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, says that they are his letter of recommendation. In fact, a letter that has been written by Christ himself through his Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine that. You are my letter of recommendation a letter written by Christ by his spirit. As we've seen so far in 2 Corinthians, Paul has been dealing with the difficulties and the pain that he has experienced in his life from people both outside the church and inside the church. And yet we've seen that he is determined to continue his life, his faith, his ministry, not merely holding on, but, but doing so in victory, living as we saw as, as the fragrance of Christ, doing all he knew God had called him to do. He knew that through all the pain that there would come an incredible glory. And so no matter how much pain came into his life, he knew God was always at work to bring about his purposes, to bring about his glory. And here, here before us, again, as we've seen, there were, there were some in the Corinthian church who were demeaning Paul's ministry. Why? Because he was not, as we might call today, a powerhouse preacher. He seemed to be too weak. He, he had faced too many struggles. He wasn't the leader or preacher that attracted the crowds by means of his charismatic personality. You know, there's some personalities. They get up and speak, and everyone just flocks to them, not because of so much what they have to say, but they've got this, like, like essence about them. Well, that wasn't the Apostle Paul. In fact, Paul himself admitted in his first letter to the church, writing from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 3, he wrote, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Boy, that doesn't sound like the kind of preacher we want in the pulpit, huh? And unfortunately, there were those who would use Paul's words against him. They'd come to the church boasting of their authority and their power and their eloquence. And they often came, as he alludes to, they often came with letters of recommendation from those who wanted to help promote their ministry, most likely those who were part of, of their group and maybe even a pharisaical part of the church. That is, those who were attempting to bring the Gentiles back into a Jewish way of living and relating to God. Back under, Yes, you can believe in Jesus, but you also have to come under the law. And Paul had to do, deal with that a lot through his ministry. And thus, we read in Paul's words here in verses 1 through 3, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing. Listen, we don't need letters of recommendation to come to you and to minister among you. Just look at your lives. What God, what Christ by his spirit, having worked through us, through our ministry, has done in you and through you. Just look among you at your fellow believers and see what God has done in their lives through our ministry. Take a look at how the Spirit of God has worked in you, has worked through you. For Listen, you yourselves are, are our letter of recommendation. And we don't need someone else to write it on paper. And with that, Paul goes into a discourse on the difference between his ministry and that of Moses by implication, his ministry and that of these other teachers and preachers. And he, he writes of the work of the spirit versus the law, the old covenant versus the new covenant. Um, he brings to the forefront of the discussion the glory of the old way 
versus the glory that comes through the Spirit and through faith in Christ and thus has come through his ministry. You see, much of what Paul refers to in this portion of Scripture is rooted in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus. Can I just say, church, listen, if if you only read the New Testament, there's so much you're not going to understand. Do you know that? You have to get into the Old Testament as well. It, it, It sheds light on so much of the New Testament. Years ago, I did a study on the book of Leviticus, and as I was doing that study, I realized, wow, you can't really understand so many things Jesus was saying and what what the apostles were saying unless you know what the book of Leviticus says. That's like mind-blowing, huh? Right? Because there's so much of it we don't want to read. But you need to be in your Old Testament. Right? Okay, that's just a side note for you, okay? So go home. Right right now, I'm, I'm reading through the Minor Prophets again. Finish Daniel, Hosea, moving on from there. Well, you see, Paul, he refers back to the time at Mount Sinai. If you remember, God had expressed his desire for his people saying this. Listen to these words. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Can you notice there the love of God and the desire of his heart for his people? Notice how he calls them his treasured possession. Come on, Valentine's is coming up. Come on, wouldn't it be nice, ladies, if your husband said to you, you're my treasured possession. See, that's God's heart. And he, and, and he goes on to say, and I want you to be a, a kingdom of priests. That is, that is that I want each one of you to have access to me, each one of you to live in relationship with me. And so God, he calls his people into a covenant relationship with himself, a relationship based on an agreement of faithfulness, of a marriage, we might say. As the people would live faithfully before God, he would in turn nurture them, take care of them, and personally minister to them. He would know them, and they would know him. Quickly, however, if you know the story, the people fell into sin even before Moses came down from the mountain to give to them the specifics of the covenant. And when Moses, he comes down, he finds them worshiping this golden calf and they're eating and drinking. And it wasn't just that they built this calf. It's everything that was going around, on around it. They were, they were like pagans, like wild pagans involved in all kinds of ungodliness and sexual immorality. And Moses, he's so disturbed by it all. You remember, he took the tablets that God had written with his own finger and he took them and in his anger, he smashed them to pieces. From that point on, listen, things would be quite different between God and his people. The people would no longer be able to stand in the presence of God and look upon his glory. Moses was forced to wear a veil From that point on, rather than living as a kingdom of priests, the people of God struggled, always trying to make things right between themselves and God, just kind of stuck in this cycle, trying to live out the dictates of God, trying to regain a bit of God's glory, but always failing. And the end result was rather than being a covenant that led the people into an intimate relationship with God, a husband and his bride. The covenant turned out to be one that constantly reminded them of their sin, for they always found themselves falling short. Rather than enjoying their relationship with a God who desired to be them, they were constantly reminded that they were separated from him. But here's the thing. As time went on, the prophets, they looked ahead and they saw a different day coming. Jeremiah writes of the day when God would make a new covenant with his people, one that would be written not on stone tablets, but on the hearts of his people. And Ezekiel looked forward to the fulfillment of the prophecy when he wrote, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put, I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. 
Well, I know that's a lot, but all of this is the background to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As he writes about his own ministry, the ministry of this new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit that's come through his preaching. And Paul reveals that where the Holy Spirit has work, all that was lost there at Mount Sinai through Christ and thus through the Spirit of Christ, where the Holy Spirit is at work, everything was being renewed. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Where the Holy Spirit is at work, the prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel are fulfilled. And it was that ministry that Paul had brought to the people. You see, Paul's not interested in eloquence, charismatic personalities, sharp presentations, all the glitz and the glitter that so many people even today are attracted to. He's interested in seeing lives touched by the Spirit of God that each one might become letters from Christ to everyone around them. And Paul highlights three incredible works of God within our lives that come only by means of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at them one at a time, but they are conversion, liberation, and transformation. When a person undergoes conversion, liberation, and transformation, they become a letter from Christ. A letter from Christ. Conversion. Conversion. And he highlights this for us, I believe, in verses 1 through 4. For you see, it is only the Spirit of God that can convert a heart, that can turn a heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. You know what the word conversion means? It's the process of changing or causing something to change from one form to another. In other words, it becomes different from what it started out as, like the food you eat is converted into energy, right? The gas you put into your car. Right? After you've driven a little bit, you no longer have this liquid gas in your car. It's been converted to energy that your car might move. Well, you see, Paul makes the point that where the Spirit of God is, conversion takes place. And notice, it's the Spirit of God working from the inside out. But when the Bible speaks of the heart of stone becoming a heart of flesh, he's just, it's describing a person's interior posture as they are changed from a hardness towards God and become pliable and sensitive to God. A conversion takes place. And both Jeremiah and Ezekiel use this imagery. And so does Paul as he draws a contrast between the old covenant and the new one. And Paul's point is simply that this first covenant was focused on an exterior change, a change in behavior, but it could do nothing to change the heart. The new covenant, however, is an interior work of God. God's spirit working, first of all, in the hearts of those who will respond to him. The Holy Spirit works to make us receptive to God's desires for our lives. The the work of the spirit is from the inside out. So the law of God now just flows from within us freely rather than being imposed upon us. As the Holy Spirit does his work in our hearts, we are converted. We don't use that term a lot. But listen, we are converted Our hearts are changed, converted. Not first of all our behavior changed, but first of all our hearts being changed. Jesus talks about this when he talks about being born again, does he not? He says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. He's talking to a Pharisee, a religious leader, Nicodemus. He's saying, listen, Nicodemus, to enter the kingdom of God, it's not about following all the exterior laws. It's about having something happen within you by the spirit of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So he says, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And as the Spirit of God begins to work in our lives, He begins to change us from the inside out. We're born again. As He does, Paul points out that we begin to experience, in verse 6, life rather than death. Look what He says. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Aren't you thankful for the life that the Holy Spirit brings into you? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The end result of falling short of God's ideal is death. And when we try to work from the outside in, we always fall short. As Paul writes elsewhere, we fall short of the glory of God. 
And thus we always end up with death. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we end up with life, abundant life, eternal life, real spiritual life. We're born again into a brand new life. And verse 9, he speaks about we, when, we, when the Holy Spirit begins to work and we're converted, we go from righteousness, from condemnation to righteousness. For he says there in verse 9, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? That is, this ministry of the Spirit empowers the believer to, to, to live according to God's desires, to fulfill God's word, to live a life of holiness and righteousness before God. We don't have to go around constantly failing and falling and under this burden of sin and condemnation. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so rather than living under the condemnation, feeling as if we're always failing, the Holy Spirit comes and gives us confidence as he empowers us to live rightly before God. Listen, Paul's point in all of this is that external rules and regulations, the law, however it's put out there, whether it's the old law of the covenant or the laws we make up today, the rules and regulations we make up today will never make anyone right before God. That will never bring anyone into a right relationship with God. All that rules can do is show us what ought to be done and how much of it we're not doing. But they cannot change the heart. But you see where the Holy Spirit is at work, a conversion takes place. The heart is changed. He turns a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. He gives us a, a sensitivity to God and his desires for our lives. So even when we sin, the Holy Spirit pricks us, is able to speak to us because God's desires become our desires. He empowers us to live rightly before God, and thus he leads us into a new life. Listen, today, if, if today you know you're out of sync with God, maybe you feel somehow separated from him, maybe you feel as if you've been failing him, you keep falling back into sin, whatever it is, your first prayer ought not be, oh God, I'm going to get this right. How many of you have ever done that? Okay, I promise I'll never do that again. Right? Okay, I've done it. Okay? But our first prayer ought to be, God, by your spirit, would you change my heart? Would you come and soften my heart? Would you change my heart? Would you take this heart of stone that so often becomes insensitive to you and to your word? Would you turn it into a heart of flesh? Would you bring about your work of conversion within my life? Maybe for the first time, maybe once again. Oh, I think we need to pray um, David's prayer from Psalm 51 over and over again. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Maybe you need to go back when you get home to Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12, and read that and pray that for yourself. And so for the first work that Paul speaks of is the work of conversion. The second work he speaks of is the work of liberation. And we see this in verses 12 through 17. You see, it's the Spirit of God that sets us free from fear that we might live in the presence of God. For Listen, he points out how in Exodus 34 that after having spent time in the presence of God, Moses' face shined with the glory of God to the point that when the people saw him, they were afraid. They were afraid of the glory of God. Thus, after speaking to the people, Moses, he had to cover his face until he went back into the presence of God. Then he would take off the veil before God, speak to God, and then come out with his face shining again, speak some words to the people, and then have to put the veil back on. For the Israelites of Moses' day, that veil became a symbol of their distance or their separation from God. It was a constant reminder of the fact that they could not handle living their lives freely before God. They could not stand for too long in his presence. That veil was a reflection of the fact that their sinfulness had built a barrier. So rather than being a kingdom of priests who had freedom to come into God's presence, they were, they, they, they were like slaves, just cowering, afraid. Not only that, but Paul points out 
that Moses was, in a sense, hiding the fact that this glory that came with this first covenant was transitory in nature. It would not last. And his point wasn't so much like, oh, Moses didn't want the people to see like the glory fading from his face. Some of our translations give that impression, but that's not what the scripture means there. Moses knew that that kind of glory and the glory of that first covenant, it would not last. It was transitory, that something else was coming. This was not God's final step with his people. The glory that radiated from Moses' face, thus the glory of this first covenant, it was temporary. But Paul says, first of all, that he, unlike Moses, doesn't keep a veil over his face as he ministers to his people. After all, the ministry of the gospel that's been brought through Christ and by means of the Holy Spirit, it is not transitory and temporary, but it is a covenant that lasts. And thus, its glory is an even greater glory, even if it's not shining from Paul's face. Oh, Paul, if you were really a man of God, you'd have this aura like Moses did. You'd have this shining. You'd be more charismatic and so forth. No, no, no. Paul says, ultimately, it's not about a tangible shining, but the glory of the work of the Spirit within a person's life. Come on. Amen, church? Listen, listen, here's where we need to be careful sometimes. Because we're not looking for a physical sign. God, like, like make the light shine really e- even brighter. That's not what the glory of God is about. But it's the reality of the working of the Holy Spirit in and through the lives of his people. And secondly, Paul notes that whenever anyone turns to the Lord, this is so great. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, he says, the veil is removed from their eyes, from their hearts, That is, as one experiences the ministry of the Spirit through Christ, they've turned to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes, they are converted, and now the veil is removed. There comes a newfound freedom, a liberation. For whenever anyone turns to the Lord, he says, the veil is removed. For again, God's intent was for his people to be a kingdom of priests, having freedom of access to him. And so he says in verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Freedom for what? Freedom to live in the presence of God. Freedom to come into into the presence of God. Freedom to come into his throne room. He calls us. He says, come into my throne room. Come to me. Call me Abba, Father. Come and bring all your needs to me. Come to my throne of grace that you might find help in your time of need. And Paul's point is that when the Spirit of God works in our lives from the inside out, as we experience his work of conversion, he leads us into this newfound freedom or liberation so that we get to experience the presence of God for ourselves, God's glory as never before. We don't need to run and hide from God. We don't need to ask for a veil to cover us, to protect us. We don't need to shield ourselves from it. We don't need to run to the pastor or the deacon or the teacher and say, would you talk to God for me? I'm just too afraid. We don't mind praying for you, and that's part of what we do for one another. Amen? Right? But listen, you have access to God if you're a child of God. You get to speak to your heavenly Father and say, Father, I cast my cares upon you. I come to your throne of grace. And so in freedom, we come to him. We know that he welcomes us into his throne. I like to say, listen, For a president, a king, a CEO, whoever it may be, everyone needs an appointment to get into the office, right? But not their children, not their son, not their daughter. We get to just knock on the door and say, hey, daddy, can I come in? And he says, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Access into the throne room of God. Liberation, freedom, working of the Holy Spirit. And finally, transformation. Transformation, verse 18, says this. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That is, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we are radically changed, not just in our hearts, but in how we live our lives. For verse, listen, verse 18 is a little tricky to translate, right? But the basic thought is simply this, that there is a mirror, there is a mirror that is reflecting to us the glory of God. 
It's reflecting to us the glory of God. And as we catch a glimpse of what's coming from that mirror, as we catch a glimpse of God's glory, we are being changed so that then his glory bounces off of us. We become a secondary mirror. And we get to reflect his glory to those around us. Our faces are not veiled, thus we can see the glory. And then when we begin to see his glory, we begin to reflect his glory through our lives. As our lives are transformed into the image of our Savior, we go from glory to glory to glory, with ever-increasing glory, till one day we'll see him and we will be like him. And so this is not just the glory that happens within our hearts. This is a glory that's coming from our outer being, through the way We live our lives, that where we go, the way we speak, what we do, people catch a glimpse of Jesus himself. When the spirit of God is at work in one's life, there will be a conversion, a change of heart. There'll be a newfound freedom to experience the presence of God and ultimately a transformation of one's life as God by his spirit takes us from glory to glory to glory. That transformation becomes the ultimate evidence to all those around us that the spirit of God is truly at work. Listen, no one can see your heart. You know what God's done in your heart. No one knows what happens in your prayer life, the freedom you have before God, but they're going to see what's coming out, what's radiating out of your life. The Spirit of God comes and takes us beyond law and religion and mere outward obedience. We're not just good church kids anymore. How many of us know we can easily become just good church kids, right? Follow the rules, we learn the language, and so forth. No, no, no. But rather, when the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, we will begin to reflect the image of Christ through how we live our lives, and more and more and more as time goes by. It's called sanctification. We become, as we go through this process, we become a letter from Christ to those around us. And so as we spend time with our Savior, our lives are shaped by him shaped by the Holy Spirit to such a degree that we no longer live as we once did, to such a degree that people around us catch something of the glory of God through our lives, something of the transforming, converting, and liberating work of the Holy Spirit. In the end, our lives become explicit letters from Christ regarding the power and the glory of his Spirit and all that he can do for all those who will turn to the Lord. Amen, church. Kim, if you come, please. You see, you, I, we, you are a letter from Christ. You are a letter from Christ. Verse 3 again, he says, you are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And all that the Corinthians had experienced in Christ, their conversion, their liberation, their transformation, it hadn't come about because of eloquence because they had followed some rules or because of some charismatic personalities that came into their midst. All, Paul's saying, listen, everything you've experienced in Christ is because of the working of the Holy Spirit in your lives. Yeah, I came to you with fear and trembling and I'm not that powerhouse preacher. Right, I'm not maybe the the most dynamic leader but I brought you God's word and I brought you Jesus. And as you turn to the Lord in faith, the Holy Spirit came and began to work in your lives. You were born again. You were set free from sin and death. You were set free to live as the children of God and transformed into the people of God. You're a letter from Christ, a letter that everyone else around you can read. And we need to remember, I think, especially in our day and age, church, it's not about personalities, glitz and glitter and the vibe we give and all those things. And, but ultimately, it's about the work of God, is it not? Come on, it's about the work of God. It's about the ministry of the Holy Spirit as the word of God is preached, as we turn to the Lord and Christ by his spirit steps into our lives. We're born again, we're set free, we're transformed. New life, new freedom, transformation, ultimately a new glory. As the Holy Spirit fills us, we become even today a letter from Christ for everybody around us. What are they reading from your life? What are they reading? 
from your life. There's just two quick challenges, charges today. The first is this, turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. I don't know where you are in your, in your walk with God. I don't know what's happening in your life. You, you might be dedicated to the Lord or you might be here today. You're just a good church kid. Turn to the Lord. Put your faith in what God has done for you through Christ. And as you do, the Bible promises the Spirit of God will begin to work in your life, beginning, first of all, in your heart, bringing you into relationship with God as you could never imagine. It's not what I can do for you or the church can do for you, and it's not how you can fix yourself up, but it's all about what Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, will do in your life. Turn to the Lord, and you will be born again. Turn to the Lord you'll begin to experience the working of His Holy Spirit in your life. Turn to the Lord. And then secondly, look to the Lord. Look to the Holy Spirit for His continued work in your life. How many of us know we never quite get there while we're here in this life, right? It's not like, oh, I prayed a prayer and I'm good now. Okay, I just go on my, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit wants to continue to work in our lives, right? We talked, we've talked about going beyond. It's not just coming and praying a prayer. We just say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to invite you into my life. Ask your Holy Spirit, I want to be born again. And then it all just stops there. No, no, no. We, we continue, we continue to look to God, to Christ, to the Holy Spirit for his continued work in our lives, allowing him to continue his work of transformation transformation to take us from glory to glory that we might be made more and more each day into the image of our savior and so we turn to the lord and then we continue to look to the lord we cry out god i need you i look to you to change my heart change my mind renew me set me on a new course set me free and i continue to look to you with the same faith, opening up my heart day after day to the work of your Holy Spirit because only you can transform my life and make me into the image of my Savior that I might be the kind of letter from Christ that the world around me needs me to be. You are a letter from Christ. That's God's intent for your life. Let's honor him. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do what he needs to do in our lives. Amen.